want to start a brief series today called Put Em Up, Winning Your Spiritual Battles, and the title of this morning's message is For the Win. You know, a few years ago, there was a movie out called The Usual Suspects in which this line was said. You ready? Listen for this. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he did not exist. Do you believe in a real, personal devil? In many segments of society, and in even many Christian circles, the idea of a devil is related to mythology. It's primitive thinking. R.C. Sproul, in his book, Pleasing God, tells of an occasion where he was teaching a class of students who were studying Western philosophy. And he asked this question. He said, how many of you believe in a real personal devil? And in a class of 30 students, less than half said they believed the devil was real. The others, they said, he's just a myth. Sproul then asked the class, how many of you believe in the existence of God? All 30 raised their hands and indicated they believed in God. His next question was, how many of you would be willing to define God as a spiritual being who has the ability to influence humans for good. And they were all willing to allow for that definition. He then said, why is it then that you affirm the existence of a spiritual being who has the ability to influence you for good, but you deny the existence of a spiritual being who can influence for evil? His response was basically, look, we live in a modern era, we live, we're much more sophisticated, and it's simply impossible for us with our scientific minds to believe in, in the devil. And Dr. Spruill said, well, so exactly what scientific discovery has made belief in a devil obsolete? Is it the second law of thermodynamics? Is that it? What's made the devil obsolete? Finally, someone said, look, how can anyone believe in some sinister guy in a red suit with horns and a pitchfork? And Sproul wrote, he said, that student was not responding to the biblical image of the devil. His idea of the devil was a caricature. His devil was a Halloween party runaway, a Fright Night fugitive. Every single New Testament writer speaks of the devil. In the Gospels alone, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the devil is spoken of 29 times, 25 of those by Jesus himself. There are entire denominations that do not believe in the devil or hell. And if you don't believe what the Bible has to say about the devil or hell, why in the world would you believe what the Bible has to say about God in heaven? Listen, I don't want to focus on the devil and hell. In Christ, we are overcomers. We are overcomers, praise God. And this is a God-glorifying series, not a devil-glorifying series series. It's a God-glorifying series, but we're overcomers, and we need to lean in to those resources. I want you to just listen to a few Bible passages. 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Okay, there you go. There's the apostle Peter. By the way, the devil is not looking for someone that he has the ability to devour. He has the ability to devour any of us. He's looking for someone who will give him an invitation, permission to do so. Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, you be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. And put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers. Notice plurality here. 
but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In other words, the devil has friends. He has co-workers. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand. Let me quickly just give you the bow sheet on Satan. The Old Testament tells us that he's an angel. He's a fallen angel. Angels are created beings. He was a wise, brilliant, beautiful angel. According to Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14, he became very, very proud of his beauty, his splendor, and he sought to ascend to the throne of God himself. He wanted to reign as a co-regent, as a co-king. As a result of that rebellion against God, he was cast down from heaven forever without the possibility of reinstatement. And in that ensuing battle, he swept one-third of the angels with him. I believe they have become his demonic host. And ever since that point, he has been God's relentless and contentious opponent. He has a destiny. Hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. But in the meantime, he has the ability to create chaos. Revelation chapter 12 says this, Then war broke out in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, the devil was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. My friends, the devil failed to take heaven. He is determined, though, to bring chaos to the earth. His time is short, but he has a time. Satan is a formidable and yet vulnerable adversary. As a created being, Satan has certain limitations. He is not omnipresent. In other words, he's not everywhere. He's not omniscient. In other words, he does not know all things. He's not omnipotent. He is not all-powerful. He can only operate within God's allowances. He's like a dog on a master's leash. And what does he try to do? What are his aims? I'm going to give you four words. I'm just going to give them to you very quickly and walk through some of these. He aims to deceive, trap, accuse, and shame. Deceive, trap, accuse, and shame. Hmm. He aims to deceive. You know, sometimes we chuckle at deception, don't we? I mean... Somebody told a little white lie. We're all familiar with the story of Pinocchio and how cute Pinocchio is. And he'd tell something that wasn't exactly on the up and up. And that nose would grow and, you know, pretty harmless, right? And some of you remember the movie Liar, Liar. And Jim Carrey had his moments in there. But there was something kind of likable about him. And we always knew he'd come around at the end and his family would get back together and they'd live happily ever after. There's absolutely nothing funny about Satan's M.O. of deception and lying. Now, I want you to listen to what Jesus has to say about the devil. And he will not describe the devil as a myth or like a cartoon character. He says this, Satan was a murderer from the beginning, not holding for the truth, for there is no truth in him. And when he lies... He speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. And if you have some questions about Satan, the devil, I'm going to ask you to suspend those and just consider that Jesus might know more about the true nature of reality than you do. He's a con artist. 
He lies about who God is. Next week, we'll walk through that Genesis 3 story, when we first meet Satan in the Garden of Eden. He lies about who God is. He lies about who you are. He lies about what the good life is. And the tricky thing about his lies is that every good lie masquerades as sort of believable truth because there's some kernels of truth in there. And how many of you have heard a story one time and you hear it, but you only heard one side of it, but you heard one side of it and you thought, okay, that's very believable. And then all of a sudden, some other pieces of information came in and you go, oh, okay, now that I see this extra fact, or so, he's a really good liar. And his lies appeal. Why? Because I have a sinful nature. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. I have a sinful nature. And so any lie he tells me about the good life for Ronnie, yeah, I'm going to find it pretty appealing. You see, now, if you were to try to tempt me and say, hey, Ronnie, you need to believe that the square root of 144 is 22, I don't care. I couldn't care less. NASA cares. The Boeing company cares. I don't care. But there are other lies about the good life that I would find appealing. And my friends, in a culture that says you need to just be true to yourself without any filter, Jesus says open up your eyes and trust me on what the good life really is. And to trust Jesus and his mental map and his view of reality. You're going to hear so many lies from culture. You're going to hear lies from that little voice in your heart. You're going to hear lies from that voice in your head. You're going to hear lies from the voice of the city. You're going to hear lies from maybe your age group or whatever. He said, Jesus will invite us to come back actually to the Holy Scriptures, to the sacred Scriptures as a source of ethics and morality and how you find God, and how you find the good life. But here's Satan. He's for real. And Jesus says, here's what he wants to do. He wants to steal. He wants to kill. He wants to destroy. And one of his primary tactics is deception. He'll also try to trap you. Get you involved in something, in a pathway where, as the Bible would say, now he's got a foothold. You know, there's a difference between a handhold and a foothold. Sometimes we talk about hanging on for dear life. The Bible says, I can actually give the devil a foothold in my life primarily through anger. There are other ways, but anger is one. You know what? You have really ticked me off. You're not going to get my best anymore. You're not going to get my energy anymore. And you'll always be in the doghouse as far as I'm concerned. You have bruised my ego once too often. And what happens, the Bible says, if I don't handle that anger, whatever you call it, if I don't hang, handle it well, you give the devil a foothold. Now, he's not hanging on for dear life. Now he's got leverage. Now he's got balance. You know, sometimes, though, he, he traps us. It's, it's, not, it's not action. It can be actually inaction where we just develop a habit of spiritual lethargy. We going to church today? I don't really feel like it. You want to be engaged and involved? Yeah, not really in the mood. We going to give anything? I don't think so. And we're asleep at the wheel. We're asleep on our own Bible. We're, we're like the priest and the Levite in the parable of the Good Samaritan. We're more than happy to just not be involved and walk on the other side of the road. Trapped. Or he wants to accuse. Love to just point a finger at you or create some accusatory spirit in you. If you want a different word than accuse, what it actually is, is divide. 
wants to separate, divide you from God. You know, I don't really belong with him. If God actually knew what was in my heart, if God actually knew what I'd done, I don't, I don't really belong. And he loves to divide families, loves to divide churches, point that finger, and then shame. What you did in 2014, you will always be 2014. There will always be a stain. You don't belong. You think God could use you? You think God could forgive you? You think people would actually let you off the hook and give you a new beginning? If, they, if, pe- if people really knew that about you, you think they would want to put their arm around you? Shame. I want to read a scripture to you. And as I start to read it, you're going to think, what in the world does this have to do with the devil or Satan? Just keep paying attention, okay? Because it's a scene from the New Testament church in Corinth, and evidently there had been some sort of a public event, public sin, if you will, and then public repentance. And apolog- There was something everybody knew, and then there's something that everybody knew there had been an apology and repentance, okay? Everybody got that? And now, how will the church react? The Apostle Paul says this. Now, instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I forgive, and if there was anything to forgive, I've forgiven it in the sight of Christ for your sake. In order that Satan might not outwit us because we are not unaware of his schemes. What is a scheme of Satan? God's grace is for everybody but you. Restoration is for everybody but you. He loves to deceive, trap, accuse and shame shame is that disconnector that says god i don't i don't deserve an audience with you it's a disconnector that says i don't really belong in the church my friend yes you do but beth uh guckenberger has written a book called throw the first punch and and in her book she says here's a pretty good question to we need to regularly ask as we have a mind to spiritual warfare. Here's the question. How would Satan like to work in this situation? Would he like for us to keep believing some lie? Would he like for us to stay trapped and not get help and support? Would he like for us to just stay divided, pointing an accusatory finger? at one another would he like for us to just walk in shame and say I don't belong I'm 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 not worthy for kingdom purposes I'm not worthy for kingdom in industry I I don't I just need to maybe sit in a back corner somewhere because I'm not and you get convinced that God can't use you And then what happens is the kingdom of God misses you, misses what you can bring to the table. As the Apostle Paul would say, I am chief number one exhibit for the grace of God. But the grace of God to me was not a black hole. It came to me, I celebrate it, and it motivates me to serve, motivates me to bless others in the name of the Lord. All right, very quickly. I want you to know that Jesus is a more formidable, invincible truth teller, and he is an advocate for you. I want to point you to one of my favorite scriptures in the New Testament.
It's from Colossians chapter 2. Now, hang with me. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, listen, God made you alive with Christ. And he forgave us all of our sins. He canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. And he's taken it away. What did he do? He nailed it to the cross. Because of my sin, he says, I had an IOU that I could not pay. But what God did, and he didn't ignore it. He didn't pretend like it wasn't there. To the contrary, he actually paid it for me in the giving of Jesus Christ and the shedding of his blood. The complete and full forgiveness of sins to those who turn to Jesus Christ is the most important and paramount reality taught in the Bible. All of our sins even that one, even that one, were credited to Christ's account. It sounds too good to be true because we want to remember what God forgets and we want to pay what's already been covered and we want to earn what Jesus has given freely. Okay, but now get ready for verse 15. And in doing all this, Christ disarmed the powers and the authorities. He disarmed Satan and the demonic forces. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. You see, you do know, don't you? That just because something happens in the invisible realm doesn't mean it's unreal. Invisible doesn't mean unreal. In fact, invisible can mean even more real. And Paul says, when Christ died on the cross, Satan and the forces of evil thought they had won a big victory. We've put God to death. But God the Father took what Satan meant for evil And he turned it around for good. And Jesus actually wins the victory at the cross. Some of you are familiar with uh, Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon lived in the 1800s. Great preacher out of uh, England. I'm going to read you a quote. It's, It's very old school oratory, but it's a masterful demonstration of what Christ accomplished. You ready? Here we go. But nevertheless, so saith the Scripture, even on the cross Christ enjoyed a triumph. Yes, while those hands were bleeding, the acclamations of angels were being poured on his head. Yes, while those feet were being rent with nails, the noblest spirits in the world were crowding around him in admiration. And when upon that bloodstained cross he died in agonies unutterable, there was heard a shout such as never was heard before from the ransomed in heaven. And all the angels of God with the loudest harmony chanted the praise of Jesus. There was sung in fullest chorus the song of Moses, the servant of God and of the Lamb. For Christ has indeed cut and sorely wounded the dragon. And so you sing, you sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The Lord shall reign forever and ever, King of kings and Lord of lords. Yeah. Here's an image. Take a look at this. I like it. The pointing, accusatory finger. And listen, the devil's got a point. Is there a one of us worthy? No, not one. 
Is there a one of us who could say, oh, no one could ever bring an accusation against me? Not a one of us. Those accusations are absolutely accurate. That's why we need one another to show grace and help and support to one another. And that's why we need, can we put it back up on the screen? That's why we need Jesus Christ, our advocate. Notice the hands open, one hand on our shoulder, our defender. All right, very quickly, let me just remind you. As an action step, I want to call you today to just a fresh sense of worship because you are a formidable warrior when you are a worshiper. Because, see, when we worship, do we make God bigger? Answer, no. He can't be any bigger. Can't be any more beautiful. Can't be any more grand. But when I worship, He becomes bigger to me. Psalm 103, verse 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. And when you face those challenges out there, all the challenges we all have to face, the temptations, the pull of the flesh, the pull of the world, you know, we, we, fight, we keep fighting the fight. Yes, in the Christian life we have joy, but we also have to keep fighting the good fight. And as we face the challenges that come our way, never forget, you are not alone. You are not alone. The Lord is with you. He is for you. Your great, big, good, awesome God is right there with you. So you bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Forget not all of his benefits to you. All right. God bless you, everybody. Thank you for being with us today. Listen, here's what we're going to do now. We're going to spend a little time in prayer. Our worship team will be coming back up here. They'll be uh, having another song for us. We're going to have some elder couples. Some will be down front. Some will be in the back. You can pray right where you are. You can pray with one of our elder couples. That'll be just fine. But here's what I want to do first. I want to lead you in the Lord's Prayer. Okay, so everybody be standing. We can put the Lord's Prayer up here on the screen. And as we go through the Lord's Prayer, I want you to remember one of the lines that Jesus taught us to pray. Father, deliver us from the evil one. So as we start our prayer uh, time together, Let's, uh, let's do this, and I'm, I'm going to ask you to be bold in this prayer. Say it with me. Let's not mumble it. Let's declare it loudly and aloud. Here we go. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.